Hey everybody, it's great to see such a good crowd here. Um, it's a nice hot day out. It's nice, it's nice and cool in here. We have, we have a really cool topic uh, to, uh, to give you today from John Roop. Uh, John has been here before. He spoke about uh, the birds of the Northeast. And uh, he's very entertaining. And um, I'm interested to hear what he has to say today too. So John, you're yeah. on. And I'm guessing that already you've seen pictures that perhaps you haven't seen before, that if you think crop circles, well, you're seeing more than just circles, aren't you? Some, some pretty sophisticated and, and beautiful designs. Uh, this presentation will focus on not only crop circles, but also what I call pteroglyphs, which is you know, mysteriously appearing uh, patterns uh, 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 not just on crops, but uh, uh, on other parts of land or even on water or ice. So, uh, for example, there's one on a nice pattern in mid-1970s British Columbia. Now, uh, here's the oldest the, uh, photograph I have of children uh, of, of a crop circle. These, these are children just kind of playing in the circle. But, you know, there are reports from decades prior to this photo uh, that uh, you know, people in, in, in farm families, uh, farming families just remember, oh yeah, when I was a child, we used to play in those circles. So there are many uh, uh, reports uh, that predating this particular, particular photograph. And here's a, a photo of uh, the farmer's wife and two daughters uh, after having visited one of the five circles that appeared simultaneously on their field. So perhaps what we're looking at is uh, a sacred topic. You know, there's something called sacred geometry. And if we think of the circle as the, a symbol of oneness, okay, of oneness with the universe, uh, or the sphere as an ultimate expression of unity, completeness, and integrity, perhaps that's part of the meaning of, uh, of seeing a circle in the fields or, or different kinds of circles. But uh, here's a, an incident back in 1678 when they weren't thinking it was sacred. They, uh, this, this account of a, of a circle uh, was the interpretation was well it must be the work of the devil you know because uh, and they they could see very clearly that no person could have made a circle like this and and in fact there was even a part of this report this is a wood cutting by the way part of this report was that uh, showed as if it had been all of a flame so there must have been a bright light that a, a, appeared that night and then appeared so neatly mowed by the devil or some infernal spirit though, that no mortal man was able to do the like and the owner had not, has not power to fetch them away. How's that for a, a kind of a, a, a compelling piece of evidence? And uh, you, this may seem outlandish, but there actually have been reports of people exper uh, near a, a recently created crop circle where they have a visitor or you know, someone has intended to go visit and has experienced a, a, almost like a wall of energy that they couldn't, that they couldn't and wouldn't, wouldn't be able to penetrate. Uh, so, now this, this is a, an account, uh, or th this uh, uh, pattern must have been found by a naturalist uh, named Robert Plott, and he wrote a book, A Natural History of Staffordshire, back in 1686, and he felt obliged to come up with some kind of an explanation, because once again, his assumption was there's no way that people could have made this, it was just way too neat. Uh, uh, and so here's the, here's the explanation that he came up with. He's, he's not postulating that the devil did it, but he thinks that something came from heaven. And, uh, and that was uh, you know, some special instrument that was creating that, uh, that design. And then there are also accounts from Africa, South Africa. Here's a fellow, Vusa uh, Mazulu Credo Mutwa, who's a Zulu shaman. He's, a, uh, he's highly regarded in, his, uh, in the Zulu uh, communities, something like the Dalai Lama today. Uh, and he uh, had several things to say about crop circles when he was interviewed by someone who visited him uh, a couple decades ago. And these are uh, all uh, diagrams of crop circles that he reported having happened in Africa. Um, and the, the traditions there, they did not assume that a devil had done it. They definitely thought that it was something that, done, that was done by the gods and that they would dance and perform sacred rituals honoring the star gods and the earth mother. Uh, the kings and chiefs awaited the arrival of these circles. They would have celebrations that lasted several days. They would pray to the gods to watch over the people and talk to them through the sacred sites. This was the tradition they had about these crop circles. Now here, um, uh, 
these, I should explain, by the way, that these parallel lines are called tram lines in Britain because in, uh, in, in England they call a truck a tram. So these are tram lines. So the, in this, whoops, these will enable a truck to go down their fields, you know, to go back and forth across their fields to tend the crops, but not instead of driving all over the field, they just stay within the tracks right there. So those, those, this gives you an example of an idea of the scale. You know, this would be the, the width of the chassis of the truck as the, the truck is going up and down the field in this way. And you can see how this formation was laid right, right across the tram lines. And here we have a, a, what could be seen as a cross pattern, you know, or a Celtic cross. And uh, you can imagine people just wondering what in the world is going on, you know, uh, to see something so neatly done with no sign of entry into the field whatsoever. And if, if you had walked into the field, there would, you would have left a track. So you can see there's no sign of entry. And then uh, and this, in this case, uh, well, you can see the tracks in this case of people who did walk across, uh, but that was after the formation happened. Uh, and the, uh, the wife of the uh, prime, deputy prime minister, uh, Dennis Healy, his, his wife saw a bright red light over that area when the, when the, crop, was the crop formation was happening. Uh, and now, here's one that appeared on a, on a slope, and I should explain that if you saw it from above, you would see it as a perfect circle. But if you measured it, uh, you know, just walking across uh, on, the, on that slope, you would perceive it as an ellipse, not a perfect circle, which se se certainly seems to be a strong indication that it was coming from above, right, that was made from above. Um, and in this case, a strong, uh, 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 severe chest complaints were reported by everybody who was in this f formation. There, uh, some, there was some chemical that gave them severe chest complaints. I don't know what they, if anyone thought to, uh, uh, or anyone was able to analyze that chemical. Now here we have not, a, not just a circle, but a, a ring around the circle. And in fact, two of, three of them in, this, in the same field here. And notice how the plants are swirled. This is a very common uh, detail. The, the, there's a swirling pattern of the way that the plants are laid down. And, and here we have another uh, ice formation, in this case um, in Sweden in 1987. And you can see the people right there uh, for, uh, for purposes of scale. They're, they're standing on the edge of what could be seen as a moat of water with a freestanding circle of ice uh, spinning around in the middle, and how in the world would you, if you d wanted to, to make something like that, if you were a team of people, how would you have done that? That would have been a quite challenging thing. Now, uh, here, here we have a crop circle with two rings, and uh, a large, extremely large geomagnetic disturbance was detec detected the night of this formation. Now, uh, it, it occurred to, to a fellow named Gerald Hawkins, who used to be the chair of the Department of Boston, uh, uh, Dep uh, the Department of Astronomy at Boston University. So he's a, a pretty bright guy, and he's also the uh, author of this book, Stonehenge Decoded, and he, uh, he shared in that book that actually this was, uh, our, our ancestors were perhaps brighter than we give them credit for, because they, this, was, this was actually a computer, this uh, Stonehenge, back in the day before it was ruins, which is what it looks like now. That to, to actually measure and predict the eclipses uh, and other things, um, you know, having to do with the astronomical uh, celestial bodies. Now, Gerald Hawkins just turned his attention to crop circles, and he was curious, uh, as any scientist should be, right? He was curious. And the first thing he did was simply measure the circles. How big are they? A very simple thing to do. And it struck him, and he, his, his, uh, his wife plays the harp, okay? And he, so he knows something about. Uh, uh, the, the frequencies of a major scale. So if you sing a major scale, do, re, mi, fa, sol, la, ti, do, what you're actually doing is changing the pitch of your voice by a very controlled, uh, you, you may not be aware of it, but you're changing the pitch uh, in accordance with these ratios. So when you go, da, da, you're doubling your frequency, okay? When you go, C, G, or one, five of a major scale, you're increasing the frequency by 50%. So you see every one of these major scale notes has its own frequency uh, relative to the, to the base note, uh, to, the, to the fundamental note. Every one of these frequencies, every one of these ratios, excuse me, was found by, by uh, this fellow, uh, uh, Richard, uh, Gerald Hawkins. Every one of them was found when he compared the circles to each other, okay? But none of the uh, fractions that would have been applied uh, uh, for the black keys, you know, the, the uh, sharps or flats. None of those ratios was found in the circles. So clearly, 
whatever intelligence was, is, is a, was, was responsible for all those crop circles to date had those frequencies in mind, had the major scale in mind, and it, and it was like a little clue was planted <laughs> in, in those formations. It's almost like, okay, let's see if, if, uh, if you can guess what's going on here, and Gerald Hawkins did not just guessing, but you know, deduce what's happening. Gerald Hawkins did realize that. He also, now this is an incredible formation because you need, you need to understand here that these plants are not just simply laid down flat as every, one, every other one that you've seen so far. You can see that they're little uh, knobs, <laughs> nubbly knobs, <laughs> whatever you want to call them, of, uh, you know, that they're, they're actually bent at different levels. You know, some crops, uh, some plants are bent at this level, some at this level, some at this level. Which, it was, which is able to give the impression when seen from above, and I'm sorry, I can't show it to you in more detail, this is the best photograph I have, of seven concentric circles in each of these circles, and 48 spokes, lines, you know, radiating from the center in each of these circles. Now, that is a highly sophisticated thing to do uh, in this formation, I think you'll agree. But not only that, but uh, Gerald Hawkins also realized that, what he that we were looking at one of the four Euclidean theorems. Here it is one of the four Euclidean theorems. If you're curious to learn more about Euclidean theorems, well, you know where to go, the internet, right? <laughs> uh, now notice here, once again, it's not a, it's, it, 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 we're not simply looking at a, a swirled uh, plants. The plants are laid down precisely so that in this quadrant, they're going one way. In this quadrant, they're going another way. So as to create the impression when seen from above, and clearly these patterns are meant to be seen from above, uh, of light and dark, uh, quadrants. So it, it would depend entirely on where the sun is and how the sun is reflecting on those quadrants, whether you see them as light or dark. But you see that contrast and also the circle in the middle where it's swirled one way and the, there's another uh, rim here of, of plants where it's uh, swirled the opposite direction. So, you know, there's, does, does this mean something? Well, anyone, you know, we're not being told what they mean. In, in no case has anyone come forward and say, well, well we made this, and here's, <laughs> here's the message that we intended. Everything here is a mystery, okay? Uh, now these, I, I need to tell you that these uh, orbital rings here, you see these very narrow rings, um, and these are just, you know, a tra uh, the, uh, trails of people who had passed the people going to and from the, the crop circle, but these, were actually made in such a way that they were so narrow that if you walked in them, you'd make them wider. They're only a few plants wide. Now that's clear evidence that they couldn't have been made by walking around and flattening the plants. They had to be made, in, it, it seems to me, from above, right? They had to be, there had to be some direction, uh, some energy causing them to, to bend in that way. Uh, and here's another similar, uh, you know, two of these series of, they, they almost looked like uh, uh, celestial bodies with orbits, you know, planets orbiting around or the, or the like. Here's one in which, uh, you know, speaking of degree of, of difficulty, all we see is these orbital rings plus a lot of randomly appearing, uh, they call them grape shot, these, these t tiny little circles. Uh, and again, how in the world would you have made them uh, you, you couldn't just leap from one place to the next and then make another circle and then leap to another place. I mean, there's, there's no way that, that that would be possible. So uh, along with those, these very narrow orbital rings. So they had to have been made from above. Uh, here's an interesting uh, diagram. And someone, uh, you know, no one is saying, well, you're right or wrong, you know, but someone, uh, but uh, it's, it's been suggested that perhaps this pattern is a reference to a tuning fork. And uh, I think this is kind of comical because here we have a, a, a formation on Telegraph Hill. And does this seem like, you know, just like a telegraph is a way of communicating something, doesn't it seem like a message is being sent out right there with the you know, radiating bands of frequency? Now, here's a, a photo, a, a remarkable photo of a fellow. This fellow actually discovered this formation uh, and, he, and he wanted his picture taken with it, which is a natural thing to, to want. Uh, and as the photogra photographer is taking the picture, something is falling from the sky, almost uh, lands on, the, on his head, and narrowly misses his head. Uh, these large quantities of these metal spheres were actually found near the uh, formation. Now, is, is there something, is, if we're positing here that there's an energy coming from above to make the formations, perhaps that self-same energy was responsible for 
causing all those metal spheres to break off of an asteroid, for example, and land right there near the formation. Now, here's another formation laid right along tram lines, and it, you can see that it's a, uh, we've got circles, we've got rectangles, you know, and, and the, this, this space between the tram lines has been flattened as well. Uh, but, you know, if you're someone like Gerald Hawkins, you want to learn more. You know, you're, you're thinking that, well, there, there might be some, some kind of content to this. And indeed, uh, I don't know who actually figured this riddle out, but this is the diagram upon which that formation is based. So if you, if you see how, how it works, let's, let's just draw a circle starting with this as a central point, okay, there, and, and make the circle just big enough so that it's gonna touch the side of this circle in the, in the formation. Well, it just so happens that you can create a five-pointed star that touches th the circumference of this circle at five places, exactly. Not only that, but it also touches that corner this corner of this rectangle and this corner of that rectangle. Do you see how that works? And then everything about <laughs> this formation then can be um, created uh, with three different circles, each of them having five pointed stars inside them, exactly as you see here. And of course, the final formation doesn't show those circles and the five pointed stars. It's almost as if someone has created that pattern, then erased all the, the, the design itself and just, uh, okay, this is what you're left with. And it's, a, it's a something of a riddle, isn't it? It's much like a, you know, when you open your newspaper in the morning, there's a crossword puzzle, and you get to try to figure it out. But it's very different from a crossword puzzle because there are no rules. <laughs> you know, a crossword puzzle, you know, the, it's, the, it's very clear what you're trying to figure out. What, you, know, you, you, uh, you, you have a clue, and you have to figure out what word the person who created it meant. But there are no rules of this. There are no guidelines about what it is that's, that's happening. Something like this uh, event here, this crop formation, it seems, uh, it seems to me like it's just a, a, an honoring of what's in the landscape, landscape already. Here we have a monument, which is clearly man-made, a man-made monument and a, and a circle around it. And there's the circle, which is a stand-in for the monument, and, a, and another larger circle, which kind of symbolizes this area. And back in two, 1990, uh, which is almost three decades ago now. Uh, thousands of people came from all over the world to visit these formations, they, because clearly they were really becoming larger and more complex, as you can see. In fact, people called these formations pictograms, okay? Uh, and this is the same formation, by the way, just seen from a different angle. Uh, and I want you to notice something. Not only are we, are we seeing perfect circles and perfect rectangles, but we're also seeing things like here, here and here, which are not perfect circles or rectangles or, or parts of circles. They're, they're crude and organic almost, you know, and perhaps they're intended to look organic. But uh, I, I can't say that, there, that anyone has come up with an idea. This clearly looks like some kind of code, doesn't it? And, but there's no, uh, no one has, has come forward and said, well, I figured out what they meant. You know, it's, it's still, it remains a mystery uh, almost three decades to, ago. Here's another one of those kinds of pictograms, the same year, the same month. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I think that this, I, I think you'll agree that this happening should have been recorded on the front page of every newspaper and, and people should have been talking about it. This happened, uh, this is, there's no vegetation here. This is a dry lake bed. So it's a desert. Uh, and overnight, this extremely elaborate design, which happens to be part of the Hindu tradition, it's called the Sri Yantra, okay? Uh, and the, the purpose of this design was that if you uh, gazed at the dot right in the middle of these intersecting triangles, it would help you to uh, elevate your consciousness, to achieve enlightenment. I mean, that was the belief, you know, that of the people who created it. This was an object of devotion, much like a mantra is something that someone might say to achieve enlightenment. This is a, a yantra, is something that you would look at and you would gaze at, and it was intended for the same purpose. Oops, excuse me. So uh, here you have 13.1 miles of, of uh, perfectly formed lines that happened overnight, uh, and you, you can see in this photo, there are two people right there. You can see it for this, the scale, okay? There are two people right there in the center of them. Quite a remarkable event, right? Just perfectly formed. Uh, the, the lines were, were chiseled into the dry lake bed about three inches down, 
not a mistake there. There's not a single mistake. And sometimes there are some pretty dramatic special effects. We've already learned about, for example, in, back in the 17th century, one that seemed to have had a bright white light. Well, this one, <laughs> Uh, and, and imagine being the warden of the Barbary Castle now, and imagine you're experiencing, <clears throat> suddenly you, you hear this, uh, the most colossal roar coupled with a pulsing hum at 3.30 in the morning, like 100 planes going over, and then the next morning, uh, there it is. In daylight, there is a formation. Uh, now, does this happen with every crop circle? N certainly not. You know, I, my impression with crop circles, it's a little bit like we're witnessing something like... Uh, uh, fireworks. You know, every time that, that, that you see a fireworks display, you're not wanting to see the same fireworks display that you saw yes, last year, you're wanting to see something new. And so the creators of these formations are giving us not only the designs which are new, but also the special effects to go along with them, which are novel for that particular <coughs> uh, crop circle. Incidentally, this is the, for, the design that, that appeared on the front cover of a book called Secrets in the Fields by Freddie Silva. And this, that book was the, one, was the book that um, made me aware of this whole phenomenon. And we're talking about just a decade ago. So 11 years ago, I had no knowledge whatsoever about crop circles, none. I mean, I'd heard about them, and I, I thought, well, okay, maybe. But I hadn't even really seen much, many, much pictures. I just heard about them, right? Having read this book, though, uh, I realized there was a whole lot that I hadn't learned that I, I was curious. I mean, who wouldn't be, you know, to see such remarkable things happening uh, right here on, on Earth. We're, we're living in a time of miracles, I would say. Someone tromped out, <laughs> he made a crude crop formation here, tromped out the letters, talk to us, exclamation mark, in the field. And darned if the creators, I'm, we're, I think it's safe to assume that the same, the, you know, the creators of the crop formations that we've seen to date came out Came, uh, you know, gave us this response. Now remember, uh, Gerald Hawkins, who, who uh, you know, came up with the notes of the musical scale, he thought it was in, uh, that this message was in Latin, and he translated it as, I am against acts of cunning. You can see three other translations that three other people came up with. Two of them thought it was actually in Hebrew rather than Latin. I can't tell you which of those is correct, and perhaps all four of them are. Could it, isn't it possible that all four of them could be correct? Or and maybe even more than that. <laughs> so, because if we're assuming an intelligence that is way beyond ours, that is creating these formations, then they would be able to do such a thing. And, and, they're, and, and so they're letting us know, yes, we're trying to communicate with you, but we, are, we don't feel that it's uh, wise to, 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 get, to tell you everything right now, okay? But what they are doing is they're showing us some incredible detail. Like this right here is a Mandelbrot fractal. Now, a fractal is a repeating pattern. Uh, and, and actually, in, in this case, the Mandelbrot fractal uh, is, a, is based on a formula using imaginary numbers, you know, the square root of a negative number. Anyone who's gone to school and math, learned about math knows that's impossible. But if you're a mathematician, you can explore impossibilities like that, which is why they call them irrational numbers. So the Man Mandelbrot fractal is a graph and, that, and this is what it looks like. And the detail just goes on and on and on. In fact, this is, this, is the, this is not art here. This is actually the mathematical representation of that graph that just keeps on going on and on in greater detail. And you can see how this formation approximates very closely the Mandelbrot fractal. It doesn't have all the detail going on in, into infinity, but it certainly has the beginnings of it. Now, I wonder if anyone here remembers the supposed confession of Doug and Dave. Doug and Dave said, oh yes, we, we made them all. We made them all, they said. We made them all. Think of, think of what you've seen so far and think about how pre preposterous that is, all right? Now, before I, uh, uh, well, here we go. I mean, this is, this is their claim, right? This is their claim. This, this fellow says he, he uses this, this device dangling from his, the visor of his baseball cap as, as a way to create the formation, right? Uh, and to make perfectly straight lines at the dead of night. And, but they would have had to jump or pole vault into standing crop a distance of 35 feet. Their only motive was to have a laugh. Their wives didn't notice that they were gone any of these times. Now, this, no, now any newspaper reporter should have laughed at them 
But no, actually, many of them reported this as being fact. And in, uh, what, what seems to me is that uh, a lot of folks wanted there to be an explanation. And here they were, Doug and Dave, coming up with an explanation so that we could now dismiss this whole phenomenon and say, oh, it's just, it's just hoaxers, right? By the way, uh, there is considerable evidence that these two folks, uh, these two uh, uh, gentlemen, uh, <laughs> I will call them charitably gentlemen, were paid handsomely by the MI5 to do just that, to, to claim. The MI5, by the way, is the British version of the CIA, right? The MI5 paid them to make the claim that they had done this. So, and so the MI5 and other powers that be clearly had an interest that people not learn about that. And you can be assured that they were trying to learn as much as they can, but they didn't want us to learn. Now here's a fellow in the middle of the night in Russia, uh, 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 an elderly gentleman who reported in the middle of the night uh, seeing a, a, a bright light, like, like daylight, just a, and, then, and then it's gone, you know, and then dark again. And then the next morning, there he sees out of, the, out of his window uh, concentric circles. So, so here again, this is not a crop circle. This is a, a, these are patterns of, of snow on the ground below him. And here's, see these concentric circles here overlying the main pattern? just as an, another detail of difficulty to add to the whole thing. Seven people decided that they would attempt to communicate with the crop circle creators, <laughs> that they would be open. And they, what they did was they sat down and meditated. They meditated. OK, then, OK, now we're being, we're, we're uh, you know, the, the goal was just to be open, to see what, what would happen. Five of those seven people independently saw this diagram in their mind's eye as they were meditating. The next day, they were rewarded with that self-same diagram, in, uh, demonstrating clearly to them that they, in fact, had, in, had made contact right, with the, the, uh, the beings who are creating these formations. Could this also be a kind of, you know, I mean, again, the, the idea of crop formations as being sacred symbols. You know, this uh, 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 mandala is a, is a kind of a, uh, you know, a, a, a geometrical construction and uh, abstract, but it's, it's meant to, you know, just looking at it, just like the Sri Yantra that we saw earlier, it's meant to help you to feel relaxed or perhaps in tune with nature, in tune with yourself, in, in connection with, with all of nature and, and all, of, all of creation. Notice how uh, we're, we're getting pretty sophisticated here, right? Not only the patterns themselves, but the way that the crops are lying down in the formations. It makes them uh, almost um, glow, you know what I mean? Uh, it, it, or shimmer, right? Just the way that the crops are laid down. They're not laid down at all. And of course here in quadrants, almost like you're looking at a kite flying you know, with, with four, four sections. Um, so the, those plants are not lying down in a random way at all. Well now, here we have uh, uh, an ancient um, sacred site. And many of these, all, all these uh, images that I've been showing you are, are from southern England, by the way, because southern England has always been the epicenter. I'm not saying that every crop formation is in southern England. This year, for example, and there have been about 30 already uh, across, all over the world, there have been more in France than in England. It's the first year that I'm aware of that this has happened, by the way. The first year that there's more in any other country than in England. And I, no one knows why. <laughs> That's what this phenomenon is like. There, there are a lot more questions that there, than there are answers. But here we are. Uh, a, a lot of the formations seem to be near sacred sites, and this is no exception. Doesn't this look like a, a spider's web? And do you suppose that there might be a geometrical pattern that this spider's web is based on. There certainly is. So once again, we have circles with five pointed stars inside them, don't we? And then using those uh, as, as reference points, uh, you can see how these radiating circles have uh, that dot right here, that imaginary dot as the center, uh, radiating circles of different uh, diameters, which define the arcs of the pattern of the, of the web, don't they? See? We also have, well, remember the grape shot? 
the, the, those seemingly random circles of, of formation that I showed you earlier, they're not part of the design, are they? They, they, they almost look like thought bubbles. A woman named, who calls herself Ilyas, no first or net last name, just Ilyas, she's a dowser. And you, perhaps you're aware that you can douse for water and that many people are quite successful at doing that. She likes to douse for energy. And she, she said that, she reported that in this formation, which is just in, in sand, right, uh, on, the de on, the, on the beach of Oregon, uh, uh, that, that she, uh, and she visited uh, actually weeks afterwards so the, the formation was no longer visible because sand is a very temporary medium for, for a crop formation. But she was able to um, sense with her dowsing that there were lines of energy that all pointed right towards the cave in this case. She also took some uh, samples of soil six inches below the surface and brought those samples along with control samples that were taken outside the formation to a, a chemist for testing, and this fellow was just astounded to, to d discover that the chemical charge, you know, the anions and, and cation, cations in the soil, the chemical charges were very different uh, for the, 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 uh, from the samples inside the formation compared to the controls. This one has been called the Earth is Missing. Because we, this is a diagram of the sol, our solar system uh, minus the larger planet. The larger gaseous planets are not represented in this, but what we have is the asteroid belt, you know, which uh, is, a, is a thing <laughs> in our solar system, and the four metallic core planets, uh, of which Earth is one. But the third uh, orbit out, which is our, uh, this is our orbit here, there's no planet, is there? There's no. Uh, Earth is not represented, as are Mars, Mercury, and Jupiter. So what's going on? Or Venus, excuse me. Venus is the other one. So what's going on? The Earth is missing. You know, I, I like to think that perhaps it's a, it's a humorous reference to the fact that when you're outside and you're looking up at the sky through a telescope, you won't be able to find the planet Earth. You'll be able to find any other planet, but not the one you're standing on. There's a kind of a, a, a trick of the eye there, isn't it? It looks like you're actually sliding down. And of course, this is all perfectly level cropland, but it looks like there's a, you're going down into the center of this. Do you see uh, uh, the suggestion of a double helix in this diagram, right? Now, remember the Mandelbrot fractal, which is a representation of a mathematical formula. If you look up the Julia set online, you know, and, and uh, if, if, you have, if you have a curiosity about what the, the mathematics of these things are, you will find that that's also um, a mathematical formula. Uh, I, I couldn't make heads or tails of it, I, <laughs> but I don't feel like I need to. Anyway, right across the street from Stonehenge, this one happened in broad daylight. Now, that's the exception to the rule. Most of them happen in the middle of the night. But there was an, uh, not only did a, a, a pilot notice it 45 minutes, you know, going overhead, oh, there's something right there, isn't there? It wasn't that fascinating. 45 minutes after, earlier, a pilot had gone over and there was no such formation. But not only that, there was an eyewitness account. Okay, and so imagine being the person watching this, this uh, strange happening, a mist about two to three feet off the ground was spinning around, uh, and then a circular shape started to appear on the ground, which seemed to get bigger and bigger. And then the mist got bigger and bigger and swirled faster. There was a clear space between the ground and the mist, a, clear, a calm summer's day. Just think about how that would have affected you if you had actually been the, the witness of this formation. And if you, weren't, if you weren't impressed by the last one, what do you think of this? A triple Julia set. Now, this is clearly a takeoff on the Julia set, which, as I indicated, is a mathematical formula. But now we've left mathematics behind, although, as you can see, it's got to be quite mathematical just to be able to create a formation like this. So wh what I hope you appreciate here is that even to uh, have the creativity and the imagination to conceive of a, a pattern like this, just on a, on a piece of paper, okay, and to execute that on a piece of paper, 
That would be astounding enough. But to execute it on the ground in the middle of the night, that is uh, several degrees more uh, impressive. Uh, there are standing stalks of, of grain in the centers of, e of each of these circles, by the way. Truly an amazing, and just the, the size of this is quite impressive because you remember, these are tram lines, you know, these, these, uh, uh, these parallel lines of tram lines. And look at how many tram lines are in that one formation. Here's a possible, you know, someone came up with this idea. They were reminded of the Tibetan Wheel of Joy. That may or may not be the meaning of this one, but it's an idea. Here's another one the next year, right across the street from Stonehenge. Uh, it, it's, uh, six, it seems to be six trees uh, emanating from the central point. I imagine this one to be three-dimensional, like a donut, or a, I think it's called a torus in mathematical jargon, a torus in, in geometry. Two formations in the same field. Now, uh, you remember that Gerald Hawkins decided to measure uh, the circles. Well, someone decided just to count the number of standing units of crop right there. And he, so imagine he's, he's walking down the row, one, two, three, four, five, six, Wait a minute, I lost track. Was that six or seven? I better go back and start again. One, two, three, four. And every time, oh, was that seven or was that eight? Oh, I guess I'd better go back and start again. Now, this is a, someone who's perfectly intelligent and normally has no, is not challenged at all to count from one to 50 or however large the number is. And this, because this has happened more than once, what this suggests to me is that if, the, if you're in a formation, and if the formation has been, ha has been created fairly recently, there, uh, your, your brain function might actually be altered to a certain extent. In other words, you know, we have left brains and right brains, don't we? So, so you know about the left brain, right brain. The left brain uh, is, is more, um, uh, you know, intended for just analytical, problem-solving kind of thing. The right brain is more intuitive and creative. Could it be that the left brain is taking a little bit of a holiday <laughs> inside a formation, and the right brain might even be enhanced if you're inside a formation? Okay, consider that as a possibility. This is another um, fractal. Now, to explain this, uh, how it's a fractal, if you start with a triangle, and then you add, a tr add triangles to the sides of that triangle, <coughs> which of course are now much smaller triangles, and then much smaller triangles are added to those sides, and then it, 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 you could theoretically keep going forever, right? But uh, that's what a fractal is like. But in this case, it stops at this stage. Uh, the pattern ends at that stage, and then instead of more and more triangles, let's just ornament that with some circles around, and, and then there, there's the pattern. What we have here, ladies and gentlemen, is Silbury Hill. It was uh, created, it was, a man, it was a public works project done way before they had, uh, there was any use of fossil fuels and, and machinery, they had to actually spend a lot of people hours, you know, hauling heavy loads of sand and dirt and rocks or whatever to create that hill. And notice how the hill has an, uh, a level top. And it's a, it's a perfectly shaped conical hill. Why in the world did they do such a thing? Uh, a fellow named John Burke, who is now deceased, wrote this book with a, a, a Kai Halberg, in which he suggests from his research, from their research, they visited several sites all over the world that were, that approximated, you know, these kinds of uh, 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 locations where there, there, something was built that had this shape. And they said, look, if, if you bring seeds to the top, and electromagnetic energy, uh, which is naturally coursing through the landscape, would be guided up. And if you, you know, perhaps they, they knew from dowsing, perhaps they knew that the right place to, to build these things, so that electromagnetic energy would then come to the top and then bathe seeds, if you put the seeds up there, you know, bathe the seeds in some kind of energy that would make them super seeds. And here you have evidence that they provided. Here's the control. Here is the seeds that were actually brought to the top of this pyramid um, to demonstrate the effect. So that's their theory, is that Silbury Hill was built for the very same purpose, so that farmers could bring their seeds to the top and their seeds would grow better. Uh, and perhaps they needed some help because their, their, 
their uh, farmlands might have become uh, uh, less fertile from, from frequent use. You know, it, they become, uh, you know, um, a lot of the nutrients have been, have been uh, taken out of the fields by the crops that have been harvested. Here we have another uh, very similar fractal, don't we? You know, in fact, it's virtually the identical pattern to this one, but with another pattern added in the center of it. This horse, by the way, uh, what you need to understand about the, the landscape in England, there's chalk under, right underneath the surface. So if you scrape the turf away, if you scrape the grass away, there's the chalk. So this is not a mystery of any kind. It's very easy, and this was done several times in the, in the landscape in England, has been done several times. Uh, people decided, hey, let's make a, a, a white, a, a chalk horse, they call them. You know, and so there are several of these in the landscape. So you're aware that these are crops we're looking at, and crops will die when winter comes. So they can't possibly last longer than that. So uh, one, of the, uh, one of the websites that you can go to to see uh, uh, photos from all, all the decades, all, you know, all three decades, or pretty much all of them, Steve Alexander's website is called Temporary Temples, because they are temporary, right? Uh, and he, takes, he goes up in airplanes and takes pictures of them. So I highly recommend Temporary Temples, Steve Alexander. I also highly recommend Lucy Pringle's website. Those are the two that you can see astounding. I mean, a lot of the images that I've used to, in this pr presentation came from those two, those two websites. I want you to, uh, to look at this one uh, and notice that it's different from the rest, and it's actually a hoax. So it is possible for people to, do, to come up with you know, patterns like this and to execute them in the fields. Uh, and you know, a team of people will make, could, you know, and these are, but, uh, and it, while it, it might look somewhat complex on, this, on, this, on the surface of it, it's not nearly as complex as the rest of them, especially when, you, when, when it occurs to you that none of that shimmering quality of the way that the plants is laid down is replicated here. Because these have been, these plants have all mechanically, been mechanically flattened and there, it's impossible when you flatten plants mechanically to come up with those, those exquisite patterns inside the, the, the formation that you see here in the other ones. Also, uh, to be honest, I see this, this one just seems uninspiring to me. I mean, yeah, it's, it's symmetrical, but so what? You know, while everything else here is really stimulating to my imagination uh, and, and, and speak, whoops, excuse me, every, every, they, they speak to me, okay, they, they speak to me, yeah, they, yeah, right, and look at this one with, uh, this photograph was taken right above this formation, who knows what was going on there, but could that be yet another special effect of the kind that I mentioned earlier, and doesn't this give it a, a kind of a three-dimensional appearance, right, now look at the sheer number of formations all in one month. You know, if every one of these deserves its own slide, right? <laughs> but, uh, uh, and you're not gonna, uh, I'm, I'm not even gonna get close to 2019. You see, I've been going sequentially year by year. I'm not even get, I, I, you know, we only have a certain, you know, we only have an hour here. And uh, I'm just showing you some of the ones, this is a, an eclipse, isn't it? Going from right to left, we have the total eclipse. So could we talk a little bit? Um, now, when you say 2019, so there are more recent. Every year. Every year. Every year, right? without yeah. fail. There has, yeah. there has not been a year since, you know, I mean, I, as you saw, that really started to take off in, in, uh, in the uh, 1980s. So in those three decades, uh, there have been more and more every year in, in general. Well, I, I shouldn't say that. Uh, there are some years that there have been a lot more than others. Wow. Now, but, what, what do the skeptics say? Okay. What is the explanation that they... I'll tell you what the skeptics say. People have done them. The problem with what skeptics have to say is that they don't know any of what I've just told you. 
You know, they, they, had, they have no clue about what is actually going on. Uh, now, now since, uh, since we're talking about this, I'm going to uh, bring you to another part of this. Um, uh, let's see. Is this is only in England? No, they happen elsewhere as well. Okay, so here is, uh, I, I, want, I want you to see this um, slide as an ex explanation of what's going on. These are normal plants, no, normal st uh, stems of plants, okay? These are called nodes. Okay, those are called plant nodes, and often a, a node can be a place of attachment for a leaf. So you can see how, here, in the crop formation, these nodes have been stretched and bent. I want, you to, I want that to sink in. The nodes have been stretched and bent. So it's almost, I mean, you can't make a plant stem become like a pipe cleaner or like a plastic straw, right? It, that just, that's impossible. And yet the impossible is happening in the field. The, these plants have been made elastic in a split second, and the plants are being directed which, you know, in, in not only whether to fall, but in which direction to fall. And then they're left, in, and then, okay, no more, you know, they're no longer elastic after that split second, but they're still alive. The plants are still alive. And in fact, um, well, we'll find out some other things that happen to these plants, but look at this. Uh, slide which shows instead of bending, these are uh, expulsion cavities. Now, if you put a, you know, if you've got a fire, uh, a campfire, and you put a can of beans in there, it's going to explode, isn't it? Here's an expulsion cavity, which indicates that that's exactly what happened inside these nodes. The, there was, the, you know, the steam inside those nodes just made that those nodes ex explode, uh, and there, this only happens in crop formations. It doesn't happen anywhere else. So instead of bending, we have expulsion cavities. And this fellow, Elcho Hasselhoff, uh, the, he, he was actual, actually able to measure the degree of expansion. And he said that it was, you know, the, the closer you got to the center, the more they were expanded. And so he was able to even estimate how high that the source of energy creating that expansion was above the crop. Here are some other special effects, if you, if you want to call them that. Uh, alterations to plants that happen in the field. Stunting of seed heads. Remember, they're still alive, but in this case, you know, stunted corn kernels, uh, and in some cases, charred. And not surprisingly, those, those kernels, if you germinate them, they're not going to be doing too well compared to the, uh, the plants outside the field. But here is a truly remarkable photo where exactly the opposite happened in a formation in New York. And yes, we have had formations here in the United States. The kernels taken from the center of formation were, were growing fantastically with, in, with incredible vigor. The ones from the edge, not bad at all. The ones at the center or, or at the, uh, you know, in the control, you know, away from the formation, just growing normally. Now, why would it happen in some cases like this and other cases like this. Well, clearly, uh, in, in this case, those kernels were not stunted. And, and perhaps that's because the, form, the, the, the formation happened later in the season when the plant was almost ready to be making those seeds. So, or the, you know, it just gave those seeds a little bit of a boost. Maybe it had to do with the timing. Whatever the explanation is, in this case, uh, we had the same impact of the, the seeds being super seeds as we saw before when, you know, when John Burke in his book was talking about how if you bring seeds to the top of a mound, uh, you know, of, of that uh, Silbury Hill, the same impact where the seeds actually germinated with more vigor than they ordinarily would have. So, uh, so getting back to what, the, what do the skeptics say, the skeptics don't even know this stuff. <laughs> they, don't, they have no idea and they don't, if, if they have read about it, they're dishonest and they're not even letting, letting on that they know about it. Okay, because there is, just, I mean, here's another remarkable thing. Look at this. All these plants are synchronized. Now, that just doesn't happen in nature. When you have a, a handful of seeds and you scatter them and they germinate, some are taller than others, right? That's the natural order of things. Not here. Synchronization of growth. Uh, some other uh, in, uh, impacts. Uh, imagine seeing plants like this. Now, here's, a, here's an interesting slide. Uh, these are, this is a ghost formation. So the year, you know, you ask the question, how long do they last? Well, of course, uh, the farmer's going to sow 
seeds in the, next, in the field, same field the next year. He sows the seeds, and look at how well the, for, the ones in, right where the formation was the previous year, look at how well they're doing. Something must have happened to the soil to encourage the growth of those seeds, but that doesn't always happen. In this case, those plants look, look uh, stunted. But in, a, in any case, what you're seeing is uh, a ghost formation, and you're seeing a clear impact not only on the plants, but on the soil itself, which, which is, uh, and, and here's another example of that, in this case, in the winter, when it snows, well, there you have the formation again, because somehow, outside of the formation, everything was able to melt, but the soil was cooler, uh, you know, and didn't, and didn't allow the snow to melt as quickly, with, and, and, and yet, here's another one, another ghost formation where exactly the opposite happened. The snow melted faster where there was snow. Is anybody doing <laughs> Does anyone know what now? Is anybody doing any chemical analysis on something that, like this? That is a totally reasonable question to ask. Now, here's an example of a chemical analysis. Just, it just so happens the next slide will answer partially the question that you have. Here's a woman named Diane Conrad who decided to test the soil in this formation that happened in, in Canada. Uh, this, this is what the formation looked like. Now, uh, she wanted to test about a degree of, uh, of mineralization, which is ordering of the clay minerals. And what she found was an astounding degree of mineralization that only happened in the formation, but not outside the formation. So it was very clear it was a result of that formation. And what she found was a degree of mineralization that is typically seen in sedimentary rock, which has been exposed for hundreds, if not thousands of years, to both heat from the Earth's core and the massive pressure of tons of overlying rock. Now, with that kind of energy, wouldn't you expect the entire area to be incinerated? But no, because this seems to be a very highly controlled and very quick application of energy, all right, it had that effect on the clay mineralization, but it didn't have the effect on the, on the plants themselves. Here, here's, an, here's another interesting uh, phenomenon. Uh, plants and, uh, you know, every, and, and soil and everything there uh, inside this formation being coated with an iron glaze. Okay, only in the formation, but not outside the formation. Now, what would have caused an iron glaze? And, and an iron glaze implies that, that the iron was molten at some point, right? <laughs> and again, the plants are not incinerated by this process. How can you even conceive of plants having an iron glaze on them? It just, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? Here are some other effects that have been determined. Look at these tiny uh, spheres, uh, micros almost like, mi you know, they're microscopic, unusually pure iron found in the soil, these, these tiny spheres, and some, several other chemical anomalies, right? All, all these chemical anomalies have been found, and also failure of electronic equipment. You know, you can walk into a formation, and this happens time and time again, by the way, People, uh, you know, you have your digital equipment, whether it's your cell phone, your watch, your camera. Suddenly, the battery's drained. What do you mean the battery's drained? It was fully drained when I came in the formation. But no, not, not now. <laughs> and then you walk out of the formation. Oh, look at this. It's working just fine now. You go back in the formation. Whoops, it's drained again. All right, what kind of energy is going to drain your cell phones? I don't know. But that, is a, that, that effect has been observed so often that it's almost expected. Uh, equipment, ha uh, BBC had a, a, a fancy camera worth several million pounds sterling, okay? They brought it in and it became, it was like toast. It just ruined whatever energy was in the formation. It, it died never to be raised again, that, that expensive camera. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so... Um, well, maybe it's coming from below. That is a theory that one could Entertain. Maybe it's coming from below. Here, now, here's something that happens above the, the fields, though. This is called a ball of light. And the, the fellow who took this video hadn't even noticed it himself. But when someone in the audience pointed it out to him, he said, I was gobsmacked by what I saw. <laughs> I was gobsmacked. Because, you know, this ball of light just kind of pa passing over and these things have been witnessed so many times that they're called BOLs, balls of light. Uh, and sometimes, in fact, there's one, even one video where it seems that, two, that a ball of light is actually creating the formation. 
Now, if that's actually the case or not, who knows? Maybe it's just another example of one of these special effects where the, you know, there was a ball of light that was, that's, that was directed to be, you know, I mean, they, they, the balls of light look like they're intelligent because you'll, you'll, you'll see like maybe a couple of them moving in tandem, kind of like you'll see birds flying together in the sky. That can't be random. You know, they, they are aware of each other's presence. So, but who knows whether the balls of light themselves actually have any intelligence or if they're just being projected onto the field. Okay, there's so many of these kinds of uh, phenomena. So we go back to the skeptics. Do the skeptics have any answer to that? Do they just disbelieve uh, the BLs at all? Well, how can you say that they, you know, it, it takes a lot of skepticism to disbelieve so many people reporting the same thing. This is one in the, uh, uh, you know, we have our own sacred sites in the United States, and this is near a serpent mound and a, a large, uh, you know, radiation levels and electrical and magnetic fields were higher inside this des design than outside. Um, and then there are many um, highly just, you know, you know I've, I've indicated before that perhaps these are sacred. They're meant to be sacred. Several symbols reference our own spiritual traditions. This one is clearly referencing the, the Buddhist eightfold, uh, eightfold path of spiritual development. And there are seven of these symbols here, and then the eighth instead of being represented in the formation itself, well, there happens to be a, a water trough right there in the landscape. <laughs> so that is the eighth symbol, okay? That, the water trough, there's a trough of water. A water trough is a stand-in symbol, right, in this uh, eightfold path of development. Here, clearly, a menorah. Here's another Buddhist symbol, uh, the endless knot. You can see how this, d this line never ends, never begins. The endless knot. The flower of life is another uh, pattern. And the flower of life actually has uh, a basis, is, is used as a basis for the a symbol for the Kabbalistic tree of life, which is a Hebrew mystical tradition, Kabbalism. Any question? Oh. <laughs> Glad you asked. But I want to point out that the cross predates Christianity, okay? And I didn't know that myself until researching this. The cross was a symbol before 2,000 years ago, and it would uh, symbolize the descent of spirit into matter. Spirit is the vertical, matter is the horizontal. And isn't that unspeakably beautiful? Just the, you know, the, the formation itself, the design, it's so eloquent. This is not a spiritual uh, design at all. This is very, uh, has, has to do with, with chemistry, and it has to do with a, an alternative form of power. You, do you see how um, uh, th it seems like almost like a Morse code, you know, like, uh, or, uh, you know, um, you know how computers uh, are, are the information is processed just with a yes or no, on or off, you know, happening millions, billions and billions of times a second. Well, this is exactly what's happening here. This information is being coded, and the following information, uh, it's, 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 you could even call it alchemy. Those, those four elements um, are being transformed. Uh, uh, so what's happening, sulfur uh, S32 can be changed to potassium K41 by fusing with hydrogen, deuterium, and six more protons or neutrons. Now, if you took chemistry, you're not used to thinking of, of such alchemy being possible, right? But such things are actually being explored in Italy, and he, this f formation was taken in Italy, and here's the, um, the power lines, right? <laughs> right? Just near the power lines, which is a further indication that it's intended to be, to be referencing uh, the, the, the possibility that the knowledge uh, of this process could be used, uh, here's, here's the, uh, uh, an ancient symbol of alchemy, by the way, uh, could be used to give us alternative, an alternative source of power. So perhaps the, the uh, crop circle makers are saying, yes, well done. We like what you're doing. Keep with it. All right? The uncle I never knew, my father's brother, was killed on D-Day. Seventy years later, the message, no more war, appeared in England. You can see this is, this is Morse code, can't you? N-O-R. 
That's the first word, M-O-R. It just goes around like that in, in, in a spiral. No more war is clearly spelled out in Morse code. Uh, I'm going to end with this fellow, uh, Robert van den Brucke. From the time that he was a teenager, he lives in, in Holland, okay? He seems to be a conduit for crop circles. Now, what I mean by that is he has a strong sense. He, he, he seems to be a... Um, <clears throat> You know, he has a, a paranormal knowing, a sense of knowing about what's going to happen. So he, he, feel, he just feels viscerally, okay, I can feel it coming now. Something's about to happen. That feeling gets stronger and stronger until he realizes that it has happened. He knows where to go to find it. He often has an image in his mind of what it's going to look like when he gets there. He always brings a witness, an eyewitness, along with him. Robert Vandenbroeke, uh, he has a website, if you're curious, you can read account after account. I also recommend the following website, BLT Research. Easy to remember, bacon, lettuce, lettuce tomato, right? BLT Research. If you go to that website, you'll see many examples, you know, the T, Nancy Talbot, is someone I've spoken with very many times. You know, Burke, Levin, Good, Talbot, that's what, what the BLT is about, the names of the three scientists who study this phenomenon. I consider this website to be the most informative website there is about the science of crop circles. And I think that Nancy Talbot is the most informed person on the planet about crop circles. She has had many experiences with Robert van den Broeke. Unfortunately, she had a stroke of a couple of uh, years ago, so she's no longer able to do what she used to do. But she and Robert Van Den had, had many remarkable experiences, which I can't even begin to describe to you. She wouldn't have believed them possible herself if they hadn't happened to her. But I think we're being invited in this day and age to believe in things that haven't happened to us, but that have, ha that have happened to other people whom we d decide are credible reporters. Uh, and I said I was going to end, but I, I've got to share this one, too. Uh, this fellow is a genius. Zef Daman is able to look at this formation that, you know, whatever happens in the fields, he's able to figure out the geometrical pattern that it's based on. And I showed you a couple of those earlier, didn't I? But some of them are quite, you know, there it is. And he can, just, he can just figure it out. And then, okay, there it is. And then you erase certain lines and leave certain others. And then you, there you have it. Okay. So, so that's an amazing intellectual feat, but still, he's not, he's not able to explain what's going on or, or, or why. He just knows that, okay, I can tell, what I can tell you about is the pattern. So anyway, uh, I could go on and on about this topic, but I'm going to stop and I'm going to entertain any questions you might have, and I'll do my best to respond to them, but, uh, but I'll have to say, of course, that this is a true mystery. And while I personally believe that we are being visited Okay, that we are vi being visited by an intelligence uh, uh, superior to ours is certainly conceivable that we are being visited, I mean, because we have to come up with some kind of astounding explanation. One, wh whatever explanation will have to be out of the realm of your normal way of thinking. Could it be, there's, could it be that, that people from the future are coming back time traveling <laughs> to the present and give, gifting us with these formations? That's another possibility, okay? You might have your own ideas. I'm curious if you do. Give, given all the, assuming the evidence that I presented to be factual, what, and of course you have the right to d disbelieve it if you want, but uh, what do you think? I just saw the two black hole uh, things on PBS. Can you link this to black holes at all? Gravitational? Oh, Keep in mind that what you've seen throughout this presentation are very highly controlled uh, cons creations of an intelligent mind, or intelligent minds, plural. Uh, you're, you're assuming that. Well, ha I, think, I think that's a safe assumption, because in every case, I mean, like, uh, if you think about any one of these formations, they are highly controlled. There's a, uh, you can, um, they're not random. They're, they can't be acts of nature. Because nature just is, because nature can't do that. <laughs> nature, you know, you know what I'm saying? There's no, there's no means, I can't, I can't think of, now of course I, I don't want to rule anything out, but I, I can't imagine how nature could come up with, with a, you know, the musical, for, for example, the notes of the musical scale, right? Okay, how would, how would nature be able to say, okay, now we're going to, 
have circles exactly these dimensions so that someone is going to figure out <laughs> that, uh, you know, someone will, will figure out that these are actually the notes of the major scale that are being referenced by the sizes of the circles. I'm just giving one example. Everything about this formation, everything about this phenomenon is highly intellectual, highly intellectual, right? So can nature be so intellectual? And can nature, you know, have that kind of... You're the naturalist, so I can't argue with you. You don't think that nature can be this, except... I mean, if you, if you, I mean, those of us who believe in God, well, we could say God's doing it, and God is nature. But then th that really doesn't, that's not an explanation. Everything, you could say everything, everything is being done by God, but that doesn't give you any more information than you had before. Yeah. Well, it's not going to spider web. Yeah. I mean, how do they do cards? Well, okay, a spider web can be explained from a naturalist point of view. It's a... It's, it's perfect geometry. It's more or less perfect, although although imperfections show up. But yes, but but there's this there's a way that that an instinct. That's that, nature. I understand that that is nature, and you're absolutely right. But but you don't see the ver the variation of no. that you've seen here in this pr program. You don't you know. You'll see, you see a lot of exquisite geometry in nature. There's no question about it. You see the Fibonacci series when you look at the, at the diagram of a sunflower and, and the spirals and all that. There's a lot of geometry in nature. But, that's, but we're seeing more than just geometry here. We're seeing very, you know, nature doesn't just take, come up with a pattern and then erase certain lines and then there's the answer like, like you see in this case, right? Nature doesn't do that, <laughs> okay? So you're looking for some kind of an intelligence. Oh, thing. absolutely. Absolutely. There has to be some kind of intelligence, in, in my opinion. Yeah. I, it's a very intelligent thing that's that's happening. I wonder what the magic is. Now keep in mind, you and I are are members of a of a race of beings that is very young, very young. Just a matter of what a million years we've been a couple million years, Homo sapiens. Now, isn't it very conceivable? In fact, highly likely, given all the billions of other planets out there just in, in the known galaxies, that life has evolved elsewhere and intelligent life has had much longer to evolve than just a couple million years. Because a couple million years is like an instant, right? In all the billions and billions of years, it's just an instant. So there, there, if there's life out in other, elsewhere, which there's bound to be given, all the, given the odds for that, most of that life, if, virtually all of that life would be older than our, you know, assuming intelligence. That intelligence would have had more time to evolve yeah. so that uh, they would be not only intellectually superior, but spiritually, excuse me, spiritually, exper uh, you know, more evolved than we are. Well, we're in a permanent state. We're in a permanent state of development. We're in a permanent stage of development, you're saying? Uh, Primitive, oh, primitive, primitive, yes, we're in a primitive stage, yes, we're very primitive. And boy, could we use some help right now. So don't you think that these uh, communications, you know, that's how I see them as communications, they perceive that we're not ready for face-to-face -face contact, in my opinion. And it's totally understandable why they would think that. Because as long as the governments are controlled as they are by megalomaniacs who just want power and money and don't care about the human welfare, and that's happening everywhere across the globe, virtually every country, why in the world would they show themselves to the leaders of the whatever world, the so-called free world, the communist whatever? They're not gonna do that. That wouldn't make any sense. So they're trying to speak to us in hopes that we can be part of a transformation and the healing of this planet. Doesn't, 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 that, doesn't that resonate with you? Doesn't that make sense? <laughs> you know, I, I've, I'm, I'm very well read in a lot of subjects. I just like to research things. I know a lot about hypnosis. I know a lot about um, uh, the afterlife. It's a, it is a subject that you can research. And the more you learn about these things, the more you realize, oh, how we are... Previous, how about previous lives? Exactly. How about previous lives? Exactly. So. The more you learn about these things, the more you realize how much more we are than we give ourselves credit for. And if you realize that, then you start to shed your fears. And folks, fears are what keep us back. The less fears we have, 
you know, it's like a, a ball and chain and you're kind of dragging these fears around wherever you go. If you can just let, I mean, obviously we need to be concerned about some things. In fact, we need to be more concerned about, a lot more concerned about some things and a lot less concerned about others. But in order to become more fully realized human beings and to become the people who are capable of loving each other and ourselves as we, I believe we are, what you have to do is you have to let go of your fears. And I think that that's the kind of thing that we're being invited to do. You know, like, hey, this is who you really are. Who is not smart enough to figure out that? You know, you don't have to be smart to say, oh. You don't have to be smart to say, wow. That doesn't have anything to do with it. That your, your spirit is resonating with what's happening there. That's what's intended. Any, uh, anyone from any culture of any age, see, they're, they're speaking a universal language, much, much like music is a mu universal language. These crop formations are a universal language that anyone with a heart can look at and say, oh, wow. That's a language we don't understand. It, it, may, it, may, it may well be a language that we don't understand. But we, we might know some, we might be able to figure out some things, but we're certainly being challenged to, to, to keep looking. Keep looking, keep thinking, and have an open mind. That's just true. like, uh, and I was, I was just honoring you for coming today, because you have an open mind just by the fact that you're here. So congratulations. Give yourselves a round of applause.